Okay, I'm back to the moderating duties, and I'm gonna sit my behind down. So, any comments, questions, concerns about, yes. Is it okay if I sit? Hi, uh, Nicholas Gula. Um, you talk about the, the attack on teachers, um, and I just want to point out the fact that that UMass, the UMass system, is does attack um, adjunct professors, attack all of us in privatization. Um, the fact that the UMass system um, doesn't respect uh, the staff and um, faculty of, of their own universities, and I just want to point out that fact. Thank you. Other I, questions? Thank you for that. And I, thank you. Is this on? It's on? I, I apologize. I, I don't know much about the UMass system. Um, I teach at Roger Williams in, in Rhode Island. Um, but I, what I can say generally is that the academy is plagued by these hierarchies, and we know that we do have problems that we really need to deal with in terms of we have similarly situated employees, right? In other words, they're doing similar work. And then we have these titles that we attach to people, sometimes in a rather arbitrary fashion, and those titles are going to dictate what benefits you have, the degree to which you have job security. I think it's definitely, uh, it's a very important issue. I do appreciate that you raised it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Good. Jim Montero from Rhode Island Poor People's Campaign. Uh, a little while ago, we were, we were talking about the uh, Alabama redistricting. Now, Supreme Court made that, uh, made that judgment, but I'd like to know, what are the consequences? What are the penalties from if, if you do not comply with that order? Because as far as I know, they haven't drew, redrew those lines. I think it's the redistricting line. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't really hear you. Oh, you okay. were talking Re about the redistricting. Alabama re redistricting and the, and the Supreme Court re uh, decision. Yes. From what I understand, they haven't re redrawn those lines and are resisting that. Yes. So what are the penalties? What do you do if you do not comply or what's the request if you do not comply with the, with the Supreme Court? Because I'm thinking uh, maybe none of us need to comply. We are waiting with bated breath. That's an excellent question. They are fully not in compliance with the Supreme Court. And this is, this is uh, symptomatic of the way the political structure has been leaning over the past hmm, six, six years where there is a total disregard for the rule of law. So, um, so I am actually, I do not know the answer to that question, but there, <laughs> there should be a penalty that is imposed because they are out of compliance with a decision of the Supreme Court. And they are, as you pointed out, resisting. I actually have a follow-up to that question. I'm Jen Freeling. Um, that was true with Brown versus Board of Education, right? The southern states just refused for many, many years. Yes. All to deliberate not speed. <laughs> right. And, and I don't know all the details, but it was more than a decade, right, that it took for many of these states to comply. What was the trigger that actually got them to comply? Because maybe it will be that same trigger will work in this case. Honestly, in my assessment, actually, that came in 65 with the voter registration, uh, excuse me, the Voting Rights Act came into effect because prior to 65, the South was pretty much democratic. So the South had the Dixiecrats. So after uh, 65, when the voter rights came into effect, you had all of these, um, African Americans now in power to vote. Dixiecrats, there was no place in the South for them. So the Republicans were like, oh, come join us. So you have seen, uh, if you look at our history, 
After 65, you've seen the flip. The South became Republican. So, and with that being said, that's where a lot of these changes came into effect. That's my view. And I would also add that one of the more um, effective powers that the federal government uh, has and that it did utilize in that arena was its, the power of the purse. So it basically attached uh, money and it said, listen, if you don't open your schools to all students, right, if you don't stop discriminating on the basis of race, we're going to withhold the federal monies that we would otherwise send to your local states and districts. And that is a very effective way to go about this. Mm -hmm. Even interestingly enough, sometimes used in ways that we may not want, right? So if you think about the race to the top competition under President Obama, there was a $4.35 billion pot of money. They didn't even have to guarantee that states were going to get the money. They made it a competition, and in order to be eligible, just potentially eligible, Changes made all of these changes, uh, states, excuse me, made all of these changes to their laws, including lifting caps on the number of charter schools, right? So that power of the purse, I think, at the federal level is a very useful one. It's just that sometimes, in terms of the policy that it furthers, it depends on who's in there. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question? Hi, um, I just have a follow-up question on the uh, on the John Lewis uh, um, voting rights restoration. So it's been three years already, and even if some miracle occurred and there were enough votes in Congress to pass it, wouldn't it be subject to the same <coughs> pardon me the same uh, main obstacle, the Supreme Court? The short answer to that question is yes. <laughs> But we are seeing the resistance, you know. Um, we are seeing such resistance in Congress to this. So the question remains, why? We all know the answer to that, because that is um, another method to disenfranchise folks from voting. Because again, uh, there's a lot at stake, depending upon what side of the political aisle you are on. So uh, folks in power are going to do everything they can to maintain that power base. Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy Johnson. And I, at the risk of sounding really stupid, where is Shelby County? Alabama. Alabama. <laughs> and uh, not so stupid, hopefully. Uh, what do you say to young people, particularly those who are newly able to vote in the best case scenario? What do you say to them? My vote's not going to make a difference. Things are a mess and I can't do anything. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'll start with that and say one thing that I would encourage young people is to, first and foremost, know your history. Because okay? history oftentimes repeats itself. And we are seeing coming uh, some of the rhetoric coming out of the mouth of the front runner uh, echoes a certain dictator from Germany back in the 1930s. So a lot of times, history repeats itself. Young people should become educated to the issues that are abound. Again, uh, a lot of times, some of these um, some of these laws or some of these uh, proposals are shrouded and purposely made confusing to um, have you not understand the issues. A lot of times, you want to vote your interest. You want. You, uh, it's amazing to me that the vast majority of folks do not vote their interests. They're going to vote against their interests. It makes no sense. So um, short answer, OK, definitely your vote counts. We saw Bush v. Gore. Bush v. Gore, 
and how that election actually was decided by the Supreme Court because that election was that close. So every vote counts. Uh, obviously, it's the subject of this day to me, so I'm going to ask another question. Uh, internationally, uh, we and other nations have sent observers to the polls to, to uh, oversee some of the. Uh, should I get a little closer? Is this better? Okay. It, we sent people to other nations for, uh, you know, in observers. Jimmy Carter was a great example of that. He'd always be at in some foreign nation observing their democracy and how they, uh, how people exercise their voting rights. In lieu of what's going on here and the attack on our voting rights, would you advocate having those same international observers here observing the way that we vote in this next election? Because I really think that it's under threat. I mean, we've talked about a lot of, a lot of suppression, but you know, this is like the first time I've, I've heard since the last election anyway, where there's a possibility of violence at the polls and people being intimidated and, and other, you know, nefarious means. So I just want to know what your thoughts are about that. Okay. Huh. Short answer, I think we should practice what we preach, number one. <laughs> and Yeah, I, I would advocate for that. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Janice. I'm hey, Janice. from 1199 and PPC. Uh, my question is, here in Massachusetts, I know as I'm a warding of one of the precincts in Worcester, um, when voters come in and they are not registered because they come from another state, we don't have it in Massachusetts where we can register here. What can we do to do that? At the same day, at the same time that the um, voter comes in, we can register them right there in the dock, not lose a vote. Right. Yep. We're fortunate enough to be in Massachusetts where our laws are a lot more liberal when it comes to voting and access to the vote. But I think she's saying like we can't register to vote the day of the election. Right. So that's why it's important to vote, get it on the, get the initiative on the measure and vote. So I have a question. How, so the Voting Rights Act, it has to be renewed all the time. How is it that, isn't there something that don't they just renew it? Why? The Voting Rights Act? Why can't we all just have the right to vote? <laughs> that's, that's exactly <laughs> the question. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, one one thing I believe one of you mentioned the the international exp uh, example or the comparative example, and one potential idea is to actually make it a holiday, so that because again, it's neutral in theory, but it's going to disproportionately impact whose work schedules are not as flexible. So if it was a holiday, everybody had the day off, then it would be easier to exercise the vote. So yeah. That's okay. okay, one last question. Hi, Robin um, Bell from 1199. Um, why aren't we getting any more progress on this electoral vote? I mean, we have lost more to the Republicans, um, and we've had the popular vote in, by a lot. And I, I just don't understand why we can't get that passed. I mean, this is not farmer days where, you know, you needed yeah. three days to get there. This is the 21st century. I, I'm with you on that one. We almost, the Electoral col College was almost eliminated under the presidency of Gerald Ford. It's because they have so many layers. It's, <laughs> you've got to have like two thirds of the states. Uh, it's almost near impossible to rid ourselves of the electoral college. At one point in our country's history, we came very close. But it should be one person, one vote. That's why we're seeing, <laughs> you know. Yes. 